just to frame the presentation, um, I'm with uh, AMDC Micro. And we're going to talk about OpenStack on fabric architectures. It's going to be a use case study for deploying OpenStack on a fabric compute architecture. I'm going to talk about it from a vendor perspective. And my co-presenter, James, is going to talk about it from um, a user perspective. OK, I'll have to click do it manually. Um, so real quick introductions. I'm Peter Yamasaki. I'm director of product management with AMD C-Micro. C-Micro is a startup that was acquired by AMD a year and a half ago. And what we build is we build fabric compute systems. These are complete systems with servers, storage, and networking. Um, so we sell systems, not parts. We use AMD parts. We use Intel parts. We bring the value through the fabric. James? So as Pete said, my name is James Pennock. I'm systems architect. I focus on building a large, massively scalable infrastructure. I've worked with a, a number of large companies in the past focusing on building a large, redundant, reliable um, uh, technology that's also uh, as efficient as possible. All right, so let's start out. Let me, before we talk about how we're using it for OpenStack, let me just frame what fabric computing is. So what is fabric computing? Is it servers with laser beams? No, at least not yet. But eventually. Is it a new proprietary architecture? No, runs the same off-the-shelf OSs and software that you run today. No special drivers needed. It's a different way of building systems. Do they cost millions of dollars? Uh, no. Same economics as the servers you buy today. Similar economics to regular rack mount servers. But what it saves you is a lot in TCO and the way that you manage and operate these systems. So let's look at, let's define a little better what fabric computing is. So what we did is we took a look at the traditional rack mount servers. You've got CPU, memory, disks, and networking. And those are captive resources. When you put that server in a rack, that's, that's the capacities that you get. You're, you have fixed storage, you have fixed networking. And what we did is we said, let's disaggregate that. So we, we split up CPU and memory, networking, and storage into separate pools of resources. And what we did is we tied all those resources together with a high-performance fabric interconnect. And what that does is that's all encapsulated in our system. And this is the C-Micro fabric compute system that unifies all those resources. And in addition to it, we've also included a top of rack switch capability within the system. So it's almost like a data center in a box or a rack of systems in a box. So what we did is we really rethought the server. You look at a tr traditional rack mount server, that's what you see. Power supply, CPU, memory, a lot of components. Uh, and we wanted to rethink that, and then we broke that into the individual units. So what I've got here is one of our compute cards. Um, it's got a CPU and it's got memory. No disk on it. This allows us to make the systems very dense. Whether we use AMD Optrons, whether we use Intel Xeons, or whether we even use low power processors like Atoms and eventually ARMS. And that allows us to build the systems very dense. So how is it that you actually provision a server? So what you start out with is a card. CPU memory, not much you can do with that. You need to connect it up to the network and you need to add some storage. So the first thing you do is you specify how much storage I want to tie up to that and how much networking. Um, I've got a little snippet of code here. We've got a RESTful API. You could, call, you could call those commands, provision the network, provision the storage, tell the server to pixie boot, and you're off to the races. And that becomes interesting when we start talking about OpenStack. So what does the Fabric Compute system look like? Our system today, SM15000, it's a 10RU system. It's got compute cards on the side, up to 64 compute cards, gives you 64 to 256 servers. We've got network uplink cards, gives you up to 160 gigabits per second of uplink bandwidth. Shared storage controllers, up to eight in the system, allows you to have 64 internal disks. And if you want to expand that storage, you can also add up to 5.4 petabytes worth of disks that are managed to the same controllers. And again, all that tied together by the supercompute fabric interconnect, which is a 1.28 terabit per second fabric interconnect. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You're welcome to talk to us after the presentation. Come and visit us up in the developer's lounge, and we'll tell you more details about it. But what I'd like to do next is jump into really the fabric computing use case, especially for cloud. So I'm sure we're all familiar with the analogy um, of pets and cattle, right? People previously were used to dedicated machines. Those were those pets. We switched over to VMs, cloud-based services, and those are cattle. You don't worry about the machine that it runs on. You, you, what you do is you're given a set of resources, 
If it dies, you don't care, you spin that up somewhere else. But sometimes you don't want, always want beef. How do we deal with that, and, and what, what do I mean by that? So if we look at today's workloads, workloads are heterogeneous, right? I want to provide the right server for the workload, yet maintain a minimal, minimal set of configurations. So if I look at the workloads that are out there, look at Hadoop. What are my requirements for Hadoop? Well, depending on how many analytics, various compute. Memory, medium. Network, medium. Storage bandwidth doesn't have to be that high. But storage capacity and storage bandwidth needs to be high. And that would be very different from your web application. So different applications have different needs. And if you are a large company who has to support a lot of these applications, if you're a hoster or a cloud provider and you want to service all these applications, that means that you need to like, maintain a decent portfolio worth of infrastructure. So you'll have a stack of equipment that's your Hadoop servers, a stack of equipment that's your web application servers. So what we strive to do with fabric computing is, is look at that differently. So let's, let's draw an analogy. I'm going to move away from pets and cattle here, sort of use a uh, transportation analogy. So if we look at bare metal hosts, it's like going to a rental car company and renting a sedan, right? You go there, you typically get a regular sedan, that's what you get. If you are a hoster and you're running VMs, that's like having a bus. But does one vehicle su support all needs, like we, did, like we talked about with the applications? Well, no, sometimes you want something a little faster, sometimes you want something a little bigger, even on your VM hosts. You have different types of hosts that you, you run different applications on. So there's different ways to skin that cat. So now let's, let's tie this analogy to fabric computing. Um, let's say I want to provide these different services. So let's say you're standing up OpenStack. If you're standing up OpenStack, um, you have to think about controllers. You have Swiss, Swift nodes. You have Cinder nodes. And then you have your Nova Compute nodes. Do all of them have the same requirements? You typically have different amounts of storage and different amounts of, of networking that you want to tie to those servers. So if we look at the block storage, I might want 20 terabytes worth of SSD and pretty high performance on uh, my data mix to be able to get out to all the uh, uh, VMs out there. On the object storage side, I don't need as much speed, but I need a lot of capacity. So I'm going to want 40 terabytes worth of hard drives for each node and a different amount of network capacity. And then when I get to my Nova compute, if I'm high performance, some of them are going to have lots of SSD, and I'm going to want to provide a lot of network bandwidth. So really with this architecture, what you start out with is I say, look, I'm going to start out with a certain amount of CPU and memory, and on demand, I'm going to provision that to the node. So if I look at deploying OpenStack, I can now specify different types of nodes to deploy that application onto. So I'm a vendor. Obviously, I'm going to want to tell you why fabric architectures are great for OpenStack. But we're a developer conference, and I think it's more important we actually really believe this, that OpenStack is, is great for fabric compute architectures. What it does is it helps us and helps our customers more easily deploy things on these type of systems where you have a lot of nodes. It makes it much easier to manage. So if we look at bare metal provisioning, we go back to the car analogy, uh, the, you know, the rental car company has to maintain all these different cars. What if I wanted to say, you know what, I don't want to have to keep an inventory of these different type of servers. I want to create this on demand. Well, you can do that, but it's going to be quite hard. If we look at traditional hosting, you do. You manually manage that. You keep an inventory. When I'm out of this type of server, I'm going to order some more. But with these architectures, we start getting closer to the ability to say, I can have fewer flavors or fewer types of hardware servers. I can construct those and provision those to meet my application workloads on demand. But that's pretty hard. I've got to automate that. And OpenStack is a great way to automate that. And if we're talking about bare metal provisioning, maybe ironic is the way. Let's talk about that a little bit. So if we delve a little deeper into bare metal provisioning, uh, we talk about these pools of compute. Let's look at OpenStack. How does OpenStack define itself? OpenStack is the cloud operating system that controls large pools of compute, storage, and networking resources. Pretty good analogy there. So, we looked at different ways of how we're going to provision bare metal. So the first project that came into being was Nova Bare Metal. Uh, this was the genesis of bare metal provisioning. Uh, it was made available in the Grizzly release, has limited capability, but it provides the ability to enroll your machines into Nova, 
to deploy images on them through Pixie and IPMI. Um, it's usable for some amount of testing, and some companies have, have hardened it to be able to use it. It, over, it overloads the libvirt driver model to manage these bare metal machines. So I'm sure some of you have heard that there's a new project. It's the Ironic Bare Metal Project. Uh, this is being split uh, out of Nova. It starts with Nova Bare Metaling, and it's striving to provide a much more robust and complete way to manage bare metal machines. Uh, the first release is in Havana release. Uh, bare metal, and what, it's, what, what it changes, bare metal servers are now first class citizens. It's designed to support capabilities that are unique to hardware, not just VMs. The way they did it before is they've overridden, uh, they basically used the same libvirt and wrote a, uh, a bare metal libvirt driver, but those machines really weren't VMs, they were bare metal machines. So this project now makes those bare metal machines first class citizens and is designed to really treat them like bare metal machines. So let's talk a little bit, a little bit more about bare metal provisioning. So how do we do that? Traditional servers and rack mounts, uh, your storage and networking was fixed. With fabric servers, you can now specify that on demand. How does that meet that model? Um, the way people are thinking about it with bare metal provisioning today is it's a rack mount server. When I provision it, I get the storage that's there. I get the networking that's there. So how do we transition this flexibility into bare metal provisioning? How do we support this with OpenStack? And this is what we're exploring, and this is how, this, these are some of the things we want to contribute back into the community and work with the community on. So rather than just talk about it, let's run a quick demo here about what we're thinking about. And one second. How do I get to it? There it is. So we were going to do a live demo, uh, but we realized the networking was not reliable in here, so we did a quick recording beforehand. So let's get it started. So what did we do here? Well, the first thing we did is we wrote a script that will automatically scan, it'll attach to the chassis management and scan all the servers that are eligible as ironic nodes. So we just kicked off that script. And what I'm also showing here is we actually made some changes to the horizon panel. We added a bare metal panel, and this is, this is really just for demonstration purposes, but we created a separate tab that allows us to show the bare metal machines. So the scan is in progress, and we should hopefully see eligible servers pop up into this window. And it just did. That's one of our eligible servers. So the next thing we want to do is go provision that server. So we added some additional ability. How do we get the flexibility of the fabric servers? Well, we want to be able to, su to supply the um, Storage size, I think we did 32 gigs there, and we also looked at the NIC. Uh, in this case, we did a single NIC, and we, we specified which VLAN we wanted to be on. So we wanted to add this additional flexibility to the, the way that we actually provision the machines. So we've just kicked it off right now. So we told it to boot, and we're going to refresh it here, and what we're looking for is the disk. Is the disk actually going to get provisioned here? It actually says powering on, powered on, but it's in the process of powering on. But as I said, this is, this is for demonstration purposes, so it just ended, I apologize. Um, so what we were able to do there is we extended the capabilities horizon in, uh, in the Havana release to be able to show the possibilities of what we can do with fabric computing. We can take a node, we can specify how much storage we want to tie to it, and, how much, and, and specify the configuration of the networking. That way, you don't have to plan that in advance. It doesn't have to be a pool that's set up a certain way. When you have a use case, you can then go provision those servers as needed. OK, so really what we did is we attached the, the network, I mean the storage, and we attached the networking. So what's next? Well, we are, we are engaging to work on, more on the ironic project. And we really want to work with other hardware vendors. I think there's other companies with similar architectures uh, where you can dynamically provision the networking, where you can dynamically uh, provision other attributes. It can be even as simple when you provision a bare metal machine. How do you specify the RAID configuration? So we want to work with other vendors to figure out how to do this right in the Ironic project. So there's a bunch of meetings today in the, uh, in the developer sessions. Uh, on the Ironic Bare Metal Project. The PTL for that is Devananda Vandeveen. Um, 
So if we look at our storage provisioning, well, we were able to demonstrate how to do that directly through uh, pass-through commands, vendor pass-through commands that we added to uh, the ironic power driver. But maybe that really should be part of Cinder so that we use Cinder to, to provision those volume nodes. But some of the things that we need is we need boot support for Cinder volume. Uh, on the network provisioning side, Neutron is probably the right, right way to do that. So we need to work with the, with the Neutron group to figure out how to specify that for bare metal provisioning to be able to, to, to at configuration time, specify the network configuration. So I'm gonna switch gears here. The next thing we're gonna talk about is how can fabric architecture help you with deploying OpenStack? So, you know, this is really the model of OpenStack. It's a lot of pieces, a lot of components. Uh, how many people here have actually installed DevStack? Show of hands. All right, quite easy. Uh, out of those people, how many of you have actually now installed a real production release on multiple servers? A bit harder, right? And everybody works to make it easier. So if you look at, if you're, if you're going at it for the first time, is it easy to set up OpenStack? No, not at production scale. What are the things you need to consider? How many control nodes, Swift nodes, Cinder instances do I need? What type of disks, NICs? You have to design the network. Racking it, plugging it, powering them up, provisioning the systems, updating firmware, the drivers, learning about OpenStack. Uh, there's m multiple installers out there. Um, we've done a lot of work with Mirantis Fuel. Um, there's Puppet, there's Chef, uh, Crowbar. Many tools out there to help you do that installation. So what have we done today uh, as a team? So if we look at provisioning a system like this, so we have a system that now has lots of compute, lots of storage, lots of networking. Maybe it makes it a bit easier to install OpenStack. So we rack and plug the chassis, gives us 64 to 256 compute, compute nodes, and then we added a capability called zero-touch provisioning. And what that does is it brings in a config file that configures all the servers, all the NICs on the servers, and all the storage on the servers, lays that out onto all the servers on the system, takes about 40 minutes to run, it's all automated behind the scenes. Uh, and what we've selected today is we're working with Mirantis Fuel to install other components of it. We wanted to make this easier and make it repeatable. Using Mirantis is a bit man manual because we're still using the GUI interface, so we've provided a set of instructions that our team uses and some of our, our customers use to configure that on a system. So that's sort of where we are today. We can kind of go soup to nuts in about four hours, uh, but we do want to make that faster. And then we can scale that out to multiple systems. So where do we want to be? Well, if we look at installing the system, we want to be able to rack it, plug it in. Today it's a couple of hours of provisioning time, but we really want to get to the point that as soon as you plug it in, it DHCPs, brings in a configuration, and everything else is provisioned automatically. And that's where we'd like to get to. Um, so what are the various ways to get to that? So you can always automate those, those installation scripts. Um, we're looking at ways to do that. I, I think that's gonna be the best way to do that over the next six months. Um, but we're pretty excited about what Triple O, OpenStack on OpenStack, is talking about. Uh, what we like about it is um, it gets the industry behind one way of installing OpenStack. Rather different companies coming up with workflows and recipes with different installation tools and different scripts, maybe we can, we can use OpenStack itself to install OpenStack and we get behind that. But I think it's still got some ways to go. So if we were to build that out, we'd rack and plug the chassis. Triple O would then provision the undercloud. And once we have the undercloud provisioned, we can now provision the OpenStack clusters on top of that. Ideal, looks easy on paper, but there's still a lot of work in the community in order to get there. So one last thing I'll talk about is power and space. And that's a big thing that, this, that uh, an architecture like this saves you. Because I don't have fixed resources, I only have to provision what I need to use for my hypervisors or for my applications. So really, how much can this save you? How much power and space can we save there? Well, as I said, the disaggregation of resources helps you save. The integration of the switching saves you space. And with this architecture, we're able to deploy very densely microservers as well, too. We can explore new architectures like ARM processors. But I think a lot of that power savings is also going to come from OpenStack itself. Automating the powering on and off of resources. Um, 
bare metal makes this possible. But we'd like to see the tools that automates that within OpenStack. So when you don't need nodes, they power down. When you need that capacity, even your undercloud, dynamically being able to scale that undercloud to add more resources on demand, scale them up, and eventually scale them back. Um, you know, maybe we need, need tools like DRS, which is commonly used in VMware, to allow us to, at, at periods of, of low demand, re-aggregate those VMs somewhere, and then use bare metal provisioning to shut down those servers until that capacity is needed. So I think we have a ways to go, but I think uh, OpenStack will really help us realize those capabilities in a fabric architecture. So sure, we'd like to give some definitive numbers. Um, we've worked with a number of customers. Again, it really depends on what architecture you're comparing it again. When we go into a customer, oftentimes we're replacing a legacy, you know, uh, legacy infrastructure. So it's easy for us to make big claims. We've saved 2x, 3x the power. But we really want to compare ourselves to, to uh, similar architectures today. So I think by you know, applying some of this, these, these fabric capabilities of consolidating your resources, assigning just the right amount of storage, getting the density, the better aggregation in the system, you know, we're seeing somewhere between 20 to 50% savings. But I think a lot more savings will come, in, you know, come into play once you start getting more of that automation into OpenStack for managing those resources, spinning them down when they're not needed. So if we look at the density, let's imagine a few things here. What can we do with infrastructure as a service? Well, if we took four of these chassis in a rack, what does it look like? Well, that will give you 256 Opteron or Xeon servers or 1,000 Atom servers. It would give you 16 terabytes worth of memory it's about 40 RU total. And how much power are you going to burn? About 13 kilowatts on average. Pretty good density. Now let's look at it for object storage. If we did object storage, we could take two racks with one chassis, build 5.4 petabytes of raw, raw data. It would burn about 20 kilowatts of power averagely, on average. But it really depends if uh, it's cold storage or it's very active storage, obviously. So these are some of the things that we can achieve with this architecture. Um, we think it brings a lot of value to um, uh, companies who are building clouds, both for private clouds, for the ease of deployment, and for large scale out clouds to help with management, quick deployment, uh, and saving on power and space. Because when you're at that scale, those, those items really matter. So I'd like to now change the perspective here and bring up a vendor who's been looking at some of this technology and give his views on how he thinks this helps, uh, what he'd like to see out of the technology, and what he'd like to see out of the community. Hey, folks. So you know, what, what is the, why do I find this, find this product to be compelling? Working in an environment with hundreds of thousands of servers, what value does this give me? Obviously, I have a great economies of scale. Obviously, we run our own massive uh, data centers of our own design. Why would I find these to be of value? One, power savings. Hundreds of thousands of servers. If they're not in use, if you are doing a dynamic provisioning, you can shut these things off. But when you have a bare metal, uh, bare metal resource, these compute cards are only burning about 50 watts. That means that even a well-utilized compute card, you're still not using much power compared to a traditional rack mount host. Uh, the effort of installing hosts in a data center is pretty significant. When you think about pallet after pallet after pallet of pizza boxes coming in, and some guy has to take that, go to rack, and screw in the rails, and slide in each pizza box, one after another after another, and then wire them all up. That is significantly reduced with the C-Micro chassis. Install one chassis, wire it up, move on. You've just, you've just racked 64 servers. Maintenance. If you have, I mean, many of us have come from an operational background. I've had to drive in at 2 AM to, to race into a data center to power a machine on or to swap a hard drive out. You don't have to do that with C-Micro. You don't have to call your smart hands and spend a bunch of money to have a crisis for the on-call to come out and fix it for you. If you have a compute card go bad on you, you can go into the C-Micro chassis, reassign your vol disk volume to another compute card, shut down the first one, boot the second one. Your host is now back online on a different compute card. You're up and running. Storage utilization for bare metal hosts is actually tough. 
with virtualization, we're finally able to realize a greater efficiency of use for, for disk, but we still don't get that with bare metal. The smallest hard drive we can buy is 500 gigabytes. And there have been times where we've had to ship one terabyte drives because those were all we could get. With C micro chassis, if you have a low disk utilization requirement, you only carve out as much as you need. And with the scale of a large chassis, the, the economies actually work out. Redundant power supplies um, are actually a feasible and reasonable thing when you have something like a C micro. They have, I believe, four power supplies, or is it six? Uh, six minimum. Or you can six minimum power supplies for 64 servers. Now, if you were to ever, I don't know if any of you have ever tried to manage dual power supplies in a massive environment, but it doesn't work. You just give up. You can actually take advantage of that with CMicro. And flexibility is important to us. Uh, we, you know, working in a large industry and a large organization, we have times where we have unexpected events. Denial of service attacks were attacked pretty frequently. Normally we can soak that up, but if it's a pretty, uh, actually I would say the largest denial of service attack that we ever see would be a media event. Uh, Michael Jackson's death is a good example. A, ce a celebrity passing like that will drive traffic to your site 10 to 20 fold. Having these resources available in a rack, shut it, just shut off sitting and waiting, you can flip some switches and bring them all up. So there's a lot that we can, we can realize from these C micro boxes. The API on them makes it easy so we can integrate them with our environment. We're leveraging OpenStack heavily, as any uh, industry, uh, lar uh, large organization should be. And by combining it with OpenStack, we can have this one environment now to manage virtual machines and bare metal resources. But there's, a little, there's, there's some, some things we need yet. So it gives us some good stuff, but now being the customer, being kind of the whiny toddler, I want more. Things we still want to see from OpenStack for fabric computing and indeed for VMs as well. Uh, and this actually, starting one is, is specific to uh, bare metal. So when I boot a bare metal resource using Ironic, I want to be able to use the same disk image that I'd use for a virtual machine as I would for bare metal. So let's say that I have a, I have a VM and it's serving traffic, and I think, you know what? After profiling my VMs, I've determined that these would really be better off as uh, bare metal in the fabric computing architecture. Snapshot that virtual machine and turn up 100 on bare metal nodes and then shut down my 100 VMs. Bare metal comes up, snapshot works, the host resumes what it was, uh, you start serving traffic immediately. Leveraging heat would be a really big thing for this, where we, then we can have a templating engine, where we, an or, template and orchestration engine, where now we can say, you know, uh, profile and create all these virtual machines or these, these resources into a single service and then say, great, build me 10 of them. Turn up all the database nodes, turn up all the API servers, everything I need to run my service. In an infrastructure, now the infrastructure of the host of these boxes too, we need to look at. So in, uh, in my data center, I need to know what does my footprint look like? How much power am I using? How efficiently am I using the hosts that are available? We have to be able to tease apart also the services we have. So with, the, with a lot of these fabric computing, with this fabric computing architecture, the compute cards can only get so big. So we have to start to examine, do we scale out or scale? Do we go wide or do we go deep? So we find that we're actually going to need more CPUs and more memory per compute card. With those, we would have the ability to run a hypervisor on the compute card. Now, you could do that anyway, but we think we'd be a little more efficient utilization if we had even more memory. RAM tends to be the long pole in virtualization. Uh, Overcommit. Uh, celiometer. We have celiometer for virtual machines, but now how do we track that same resource utilization for bare metal? With virtual machines, we can do it all behind the scenes with celiometer reported up to a centralized thing. How do we do that with bare metal? So we need to figure that out as well for fabric computing. But once we have the ability to run hypervisors as an environment, we can do triple O, where we can have an OpenStack architecture. Now, 
there's one of the ways of doing, the, the way that triple O is architected right now is an under cloud or an over cloud. What I would prefer to see is a simple base installation of your API nodes and then a large stack of compute cards, pizza boxes, whatever, ideally compute cards. And then you will dynamically provision hypervisors to meet whatever your VM need is and have the rest available for compute nodes without having to do a complicated under cloud and over cloud, just one big wide infrastructure. Once we can do, once we have those snapshots and we have the, uh, we can meter it and we have triple O, now we can get into using auto scale. And this is something that will make OpenStack far more powerful than it is right now. Now there's work going into auto scale. There's a talk uh, later on today about it. I'm excited to go attend that one. With auto scale, not only can we auto scale the services, our, our websites, our applications, but we can flip auto scale back and actually use auto scale on OpenStack itself. You have a number of hypervisors. You're monitoring the resource utilization. As you realize that your, your overcommit ratio is hitting a certain point and your, your uh, uh, buffer capacity is running low, auto scale kicks off, dynamically turns up another hypervisor, adds it to OpenStack, and you start provisioning VMs on that. And now when we also think about in terms of we have compute cards and we have storage and if we have snapshots, why should my, why should my hypervisor be a pet? We use this pet versus pig or, or, or puppies versus cows metaphor. Why is my hypervisor so special? If I need a hypervisor, it should just be a disk, diskless boot. If we're using some kind of uh, volume backing, we use that to serve virtual machines. We can easily migrate them around. We, if, when we no longer need that, if we're, our, our buffer capacity exceeds a certain point, auto scale can trim that back and bring us down. So shut down the compute cards we're not using, delete the hypervisors we don't need, and increase our overall utilization. Efficiency, the PUE. Cool. Yep. Well, um, thank you very much, everyone. But do you guys have any questions? Good time to take questions. Yep. Okay. About Only a little bit. I just found Scratching out. Scratching the surface, yeah. pretty much everything on your slide with the Solomon integration, awareness of the infrastructure, modeling, um, the auto scaling using Heat, and it's been fully merged into Triple O. So as a community, we're, we're going toward that. Day. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Oh, sorry, I'll repeat the question. Uh, he, was, uh, he was asking, the gentleman in front of us was asking if we were familiar with the Tusker project and saying that it is effectively attempting to, its goal is to address pretty much everything on this slide. So that's pretty exciting. It's, been, it's, officially, merged it's, it's officially merged into triple O. What is a typical network environment that enables this architecture to flow? Single node? Right. So yeah, we, I think we, we get a lot of people say, hey, how big can I make the fabric? Right? How, how, how widely can I expand it? Today, it's, it's within that 10RU box. When we expand out of it, we have 160 gigabits per second of uplink bandwidth. So people do an overlay network. So they'll do a, a fat tree to connect multiple switches, multiple systems together. So that's the current implementation today. But we have people who've scaled out to about 20 chassis in production per cluster. Does your ironic driver talk to the chassis or to the individual parts in the chassis? Talks to the chassis. So we have centralized management within the system. So if you look at the ironic model, right, you have a, um, you, you, you can write a vendor-specific power driver. Uh, IPMI is a default. We do support IPMI, but we also have a RESTful API. So we've actually written our own version that calls our RESTful API to power on, power off, Pixie, you know, Pixie boot a server, but to also do storage provisioning and network pr provisioning as well, too. So we actually haven't submitted it yet, but we're going to do that soon. Yes? I'm sorry, is the question why we are, uh, why we support so much storage? No, no, I think you're talking about mobile. Yes. What's the benefit of SSD drives for Nova? Oh, for Nova? Um, it depends what type, of, what type of service. Some people like to, on some VM nodes, some people want to have 
uh, a higher performance service, so they might back that with SSDs. But you could also back that with HDDs too. Yes. No, well, if you're, so if you're running on Nova, there's two models. You can use ephemeral disks, which are local, or you can attach volumes and actually have, have those volumes back the storage for your VMs. Uh, people, both people run in different models. Well, it's the backing storage. So your, your, your virtual machine disks will be backed by those SSDs. So some people will keep multiple pools in a similar service where you'll have some that are backed by SSDs that are going to be higher class, higher performing, and some that will be backed by HDDs. You'll put them into different flavors. Thank Any other questions? Time. For myself or James? All right, well, thank you very much. Appreciate it.